Hey everybody, and welcome back to our uh, final video on momentum. And today the focus is going to be on momentum change and impulse, um, which are kind of synonymous. Uh, impulse is another kind of what the physics term for mo change in momentum is, uh, and that's how we will define it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is kind of derive a definition here um, for this change in momentum and relate it back to Newton's law. Uh, but something that might be useful for us to know here is the idea that um, impulse is change in momentum and it is the mechanism through which momentum can be conserved. Uh, so if you think about it, it's, it's, it's very similar to what we did with work and energy. Work was how we said energy would be conserved. Work was the change in kinetic energy. We used this idea that um, how energy was changing was the amount of work being done. In a, in a similar idea, impulse is how uh, momentum can be conserved in a way. Uh, so it's, it's really this idea that um, change in momentum, in order to have a change in momentum, you have to have some force being exerted on the object, uh, and and that's going to transfer momentum from one object to another. So when these two objects interact, some transfer of momentum. Uh, let's so let's let's look at what impulse is and how we can define it in terms of forces. And this will be a really nice uh, equation for us to use. Uh, we can start with Newton's second law. If you and what's interesting here is that Newton first published uh, this formula not as F equals MA, but actually F equals delta P over T, which we'll, which we'll see here in step three. Um, so how did, how did we get here? Well, he, he actually started here, but how can we get here from F equals MA, which we've been, been using? Well, we can define acceleration, right, as uh, the change in velocity over the change in time. And if we, so if we plug in that here, we get that F equals MA means that F equals M delta V over delta T. Now this should actually look now quite familiar because we have M times V. And we know that M times V is momentum. So M times change in V is change in momentum. And we're assuming the mass is not changing. So now we get that this equation F equals delta P over delta T, which just is another way of actually writing Newton's second law. And it's, it's an informative equation because it tells us that forces cause change in momentum over change in time. Uh, it, it tells us that forces cause momentum to, to change for the velocity of an object to change. We already knew because we know forces cause accelerations, but it's just another way of, of thinking about it, kind of a different way of thinking about it. Now, if we solve this equation for change in momentum by multiplying delta T over to the other side, we get that F times delta T equals delta P. And we get this idea of impulse. So here we're, we're going to use a different variable. I'm not, I'm not sure where J comes from here. Um, but J, capital J, is the variable for impulse that's used in a lot of textbooks. Oh, can't even spell. Impulse, which we're going to define as change of momentum or force times delta time. So, it, yeah, if you, you can think of impulse and change of momentum as being the exact same. Um, and so what's, what's, what are we talking about the change in momentum? Well, we're changing, talking about the change in momentum of a given system when some force acts on that system within a given time. It could be a system including just one object. So a force is exerted on an object for a certain amount of time. How does that change the momentum? Well, this is what we'd be looking at. Uh, it's a vector. It has the same units as momentum. kilograms, meters per second, All right? 
And and so this is just another way of kind of thinking about Newton's second law. Um, let's think about impulse uh, in real life, where where we see certain situations like this happening. Um, that happens a lot in sports, actually. Uh, so take uh, you know baseball or cricket, and the ball is, or really any sport where you're hitting a ball with a a blunt object. Uh, we have the ball colliding with the bat and changing momentum because the bat is applying a force to that object. So initially, you know, that ball is traveling inward here with some velocity towards the person. We exert an, a force on that object from the bat in this direction. And we get a, a change in velocity or we get a new velocity, V final, going this way. And you can see here, if I have V initial going this way and V final going this way, I've had it. Now I have some change in velocity, delta V, which is going this way, the difference in these two vectors. Um, and this times the mass of the object that we're changing the velocity for is our impulse. And it's coming from this force. And so we, we get this idea that we can apply a force to an object and change its momentum in a certain way. Uh, and you can see that energy is not necessarily conserved here. Um, you can tell like in this picture here, like how the tennis ball is getting squished whenever you have things like that, or the soccer ball is being squished off the player's head. When you have things like this, there's energy loss. Um, and so we're... And the reason for this, and there's not even a momentum uh, conservation here in terms of the system itself. We're not saying that either. Um, if we include the bat in the system, then then yes, there will be momentum conserved between the bat and the ball. But if we're looking at the system as just the object, um, we're having a change in momentum. Momentum is not conserved because we have some external force, namely the bat acting on the ball, which is applying a force, changing so it's a little bit different than the collisions that we talked about because we're not including the force, the thing that's doing the force um, inside of the system. So there's some net external force. Uh, so in the, in the examples above, the baseball bat, the tennis racket, or the player's head are in contact with the, the ball for a given amount of time. The force exerted from the player is is not necessarily constant during the duration of this collision. As the ball comes in contact with the player, the greater the force on the ball from the player. Um, and and we so so initially the ball you know is coming in and then it interacts with the bat, let's say, and when it's closest to the bat is whenever the force is the highest, when it's the most squished, um, and and we get some graph that kind of looks like this. If we were to map the force over this sort of time, it kind of increases to its peak and then decreases. What this equation actually tells us when we look at the force is, is the average force, the average force during this duration. And so we're not, we're not getting the peak, but we're not getting the minimum. We're getting an average force here, and this area uh, typically corresponds. Um, and the idea here is the longer we can make this contact time, the less max force we're going to have. So let's say that instead of um, having a really quick contact force, you know, we could extend uh, this time for maybe twice as long. The idea would be that we would have something like this, where the same average force... Well, and by that I mean the area of this block here would be about the same as the area of that blue block there. So this area here would be about the same as the area there. So we're getting about the same amount of impulse, force times delta time, but our average force is a lot less. And so this has some practical applications to it. Um, if you've ever wondered why vehicles are designed the way they're designed or why airbags are are uh, a standard in vehicle safety, 
the idea behind these things is to extend the amount of time that that force is being exerted on a person. So um, if you've ever, I, I don't know if you've ever been in a car crash, uh, but the idea, you've probably seen the commercials with the test dummies. The idea is the airbag deploys and you are essentially, it's breaking your impact. So instead of all of a sudden hitting the steering wheel or, or whatever, the idea is you're going to hit the airbag and you're going, it's going to slow your velocity gradually, more gradually than just suddenly hitting the front of your car. The crumple zone is the same idea. The car is not all of a sudden just going to stop, but it's going to actually crumple a little bit in the front. And that's going to give you more time to uh, decelerate so that you don't have as high of a max force. You don't have as high of an average force exerted on you. And you're less likely to have internal damage or broken bones or things of that nature. Um, and so that's the idea here. Boxers use this technique whenever uh, they uh, kind of ride ride the punch, I think is the terminology they use. Um, and basically when the fist is, I'm going to try and draw this here. All right, there's, there's my boxing glove. Um, and it's hitting some person in the face. Uh, the idea is they move backwards with it. So the, they move backwards with this force. So the force is going this way, but their velocity is going this way. So they're extending the amount of time that the fist is in contact with their face. And you would think this is kind of counterintuitive. You would want the fist to be in contact with your face for as little amount of time as possible. But actually, the longer uh, it's in contact with your face, the actual less impulse you feel um, from that same force. So that's the idea here. If you ride that punch and you back up with it, uh, you actually will feel feel it less. That's the idea. So um, let's kind of summarize these. Looking at the safety features in a car um, during a collision, your body will experience the same momentum change. And this this is this is the key here, right? You're traveling at some velocity, fifty miles per hour, whatever. Um, you can't change that. Your car has a certain mass. You have a certain mass. You can't change that. So you have a certain momentum. And after the collision, typically everything comes to rest. Everything stops. And so you have a zero momentum that you're getting to. So no matter what the collision looks like, you have some momentum and then you have no momentum. So there has to be some driving force uh, that is causing this change in momentum. And the idea here is if we can extend the amount of time, then we can shrink the amount of force. That's, that's, the, that's the whole idea here. So during a collision, your body will experience the same impulse, the same change in momentum. If we can increase the time over which your body stops, you feel a reduced force or lesser force on your body during the collision and that's the idea here we increase the amount of time we have a reduced force uh another place you can you can think of this is like if you've ever uh you know been on the beach and you're running uh it's harder to run but it's easy a little bit easier on your knees because uh because it's reduced force the the ground is actually kind of moving as you impact with it so the impact time is increased and you get a reduced force. Similar idea to a trampoline. When you jump on a trampoline, that impact time with the ground is increased. And so you feel a reduced force. So all those things, all those ideas um, are, are, are behind this equation. here. All right, so let's finish up with a couple examples today. Um, in this first example, we're going to look at two cars. Uh, colliding. Car A, uh, given a mass of 1500, let's call this car A, and it is moving west at five meters per second, while car B has a mass of 1200, 
and is moving to the east. The cars collide, they stick together after making contact. So this is going to be similar to our momentum conservation problems that we did before, but we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. How fast and in what direction the cars immediately move after the collision? So this is just our simple um, momentum conservation. We have momentum of, of car A, we'll call this negative 5, plus momentum of car B equals the momentum of both cars combined after they stick. And we can solve this B final as uh, negative one meter per second. In other words, after they crumple or stick together, and that's car B and car A together, they're moving this way. So car A wins. Anyone can win in this. Uh, and they move to the left. What's the impulse experienced by each car? So what's the change in momentum experienced by each car? So let's look at the change in momentum for car A. Well, it's the momentum final for car A minus the momentum initial for car A. That's how we find the change. In, um, remember, impulse is change in momentum. I could use the variable J here, but I, I like actually writing it as change in momentum. Uh, and so what was my final momentum? My final momentum, well, I'm if I'm just thinking about car A, it is moving at negative one meters per second with a mass of 1500. And it started with a velocity of negative five. So its change in momentum or its impulse would be uh, negative Cancel, become positive, so we get 6,000 kilograms meters per second. Positive. And if I look at the momentum for B, in a similar way, the final momentum for B is going to be 1,200 times negative 1 minus 1,200 times positive 4, its initial momentum. And here I'm going to get negative 6,000. And this is kind of telling. We have uh, this is gaining the momentum from the collision, and this is losing the momentum from this collision. But we can see that momentum is still conserved during this collision. So each, each car is experiencing the same change in momentum, just in a different direction. What's the force experienced by each car if the cars crumple with an impact time of 0.2 seconds versus if they don't crumple with an impact time of 0.1? So even if we can just just double the amount of impact time with a crumple zone, let's see how much that reduces the force by. And it, it, might, it might be obvious uh, to you if we double the impact time, it might be obvious what it does, but let's, let's go ahead and work it out. Uh, remember that we have the equation change in momentum is force times time. Um, the change in momentum is the same for each of these 6,000, so we can just plug that in. Uh, we don't have to worry about the negative. The negative is just going to go away with the force because the forces are in opposite directions, right? Uh, if I think about the force exerted on A, it's going this way. If I think about the force exerted on B, it's going this way. So the force is going to be opposite of which way the change in momentum is. Or sorry, it's going to be the same direction as the change in momentum. For A, it's positive. Um, for B, it's negative. So those positive and negatives are going to cancel out. So we don't really need to worry about putting in that negative there. Um, we're just looking for force. So here I'm just going to put in 0.2 first and solve for F. And you can see I get a uh, force of 30,000 newtons, which is still considerable. Um, but let's just look at the difference if in a smaller impact time. If we use 0.1 instead, and with no airbag or no crumple zone, then we have twice as much force. So just by you know reducing the for or increasing the amount of time. 
the impact takes, we can actually decrease the force by that same factor. If we double it, we get half the force. And so the idea behind these crumple zones is to try to elongate this as much as possible. If we can make it take two times longer, three times longer, four times longer, then we're going to experience two, three, or four times less force. That's the idea. Um, all right, number two. Uh, in this one, we're going to look at a sports example. Uh, a golf ball with a mass of 0.45 kilograms is hit off the tee. Assume the golf club used exerts a force of 405 newtons on the ball and uh if they are in contact for five uh milliseconds here how fast does the golf ball move when leaving the tee immediately after imp impact so what we have here essentially is you know our our golf ball here and the driver is coming in and it's going to give it a good whack and it's going to leave the T with some velocity. And that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, they tell us that the, the contact time here is 5 milliseconds, which is 0 0.005 seconds. Um, they also tell us that the force that the club exerts is 405 newtons. This is an average force we, we, would, we would use. And they tell us the mass of the golf ball is 0.045. So we have F, we have M, we have delta T. Um, so it, it might it might seem like we uh, when we're looking for velocity F equals M A. Like how does how does that work out? But remember we can we can use our definition of impulse to help us out here, and that is changing momentum equals F times delta. And momentum has this velocity part in it. This is mv final minus mv initial. Uh, this is 405. We're going to ignore the vector directions here because um, the velocity and the force are in the same direction. So we don't need to worry about any negatives or anything like that. So our right-hand side is 405 times 0 0.005. That's the amount of impulse that's going to be exerted on the golf ball. My initial is zero. My golf ball is at rest. It's not coming in. This would be a little bit different if this was a baseball coming in. Let's say then I would use a certain initial here. 0 0.045, and I'm looking for V final. And then I can just solve this. Multiply and divide. And we see that the golf ball will travel with 45 meters per second off the tee. And the goal here would be really to minimize this, uh, this time here. Because if, if we can either hit the ball harder with a larger force, then we're going to cause a larger uh, velocity on the other side. Um, and if we could increase the time that it's in contact, we can actually increase the, the velocity as well. Um, so so e either increase the amount of force that you're hitting the ball with or increase the amount of time that it's in contact with the ball. So that the force is, is doing more, has more time to do more work. That's the idea. Transfer more kinetic energy to it. Uh, give it a larger velocity. Um, all right. Our final example today, uh, we have a bouncy ball thrown downwards at two meters per second. So we are standing on top of a building. What's better when you're standing on top of a building than taking a bouncy ball and throwing it down toward the ground? Ice cream is better. Um, but ice cream is better than like a lot of it hits the ground and rebounds and rises to a maximum height of 9.5 meters above the ground. So it hits the ground and then it rebounds and it only reaches basically here. So it, maybe it started here at 10 meters, but it only reaches a height here of 9.5. That's kind of our height final. 
whereas our height initial was uh, 10. And so there is some impulse, some change in momentum as it hits the ground and then goes back up. Now, this one's kind of complicated. We've got a lot going on here, right? Because we actually have an energy transfer from kinetic energy, or, or sorry, from potential energy to kinetic energy. So we're going to actually have to find the impact speed before it hits the ground first. Then we're going to have to figure out uh, how much speed would it have to leave in order to reach a height of 9.5. And then we're going to have to figure out what the uh, impulse was during that time. So uh, to start this problem off, let's just look at the uh, energy conservation between the top part where we threw the ball downward and when it hits the ground. So I'll say from 10 meters to the ground. Energy conservation from 10 meters to the ground. Um, let's start. It has potential energy, gravity. It also has kinetic energy when it starts. When it hits the ground, we're going to say it doesn't have any more potential energy, but it still has kinetic energy. It has more kinetic energy. So here the idea is... Um, you know, we, we don't have to put in the mouse, ma mass here. We could, but it's going to, each of these terms is going to have a mass. So we'll just leave that out. Uh, 9.8 times 10, that's my initial height. One half uh, might be initial, which was 2 squared, equals 1 half. And then this is my V going down squared. And so I can solve for V down. And we will get. Uh, 14.14 meters per second. So that's when it's, that's its speed as it impacts downward. And then, so before impact or V down, and then after the impact, going back up. So part two, we're going to still use energy conservation because I need to know how fast it was going after it hit the ground. So here we're going to do energy conservation from the ground to 9.5 meters. And so this is going to look pretty similar, but it's just going to be Ke initial, and it's going to have a final kinetic energy, but it's also going to have, or sorry, it will not have a final kinetic energy because the kinetic energy will be zero. And so it'll just have potential energy of gravity. You have one half. Uh, masses are going to cancel, so we can ignore those. Uh, the initial kinetic energy, this is what we're looking for. We don't know. But this is the V V on the way up. And it will equal 9.8 times 9.5. And this gives us V on the way up as 13.6 meters per second. All right, so at this point, we want to make one of these positive and one's negative because one is going down and one's going up. If we say down is negative, you know, let's just add in a, le a little negative sign there. And why can I do that? Why am I allowed to do that? Well, the mathematics works itself out because remember the last operation that we did here was we took a square root of a number. We take a square root of a number, you can get a positive or a negative answer. And so we're just going to take the negative value of that square root here, but we're going to take the positive value of that here. And as, as long as I pick opposites, it's fine. You could do this the other way. You could make down be positive and up be negative, and it, it does not matter. Um, and you might be thinking, do I, do I, well, do I, do I need to make this negative then? And uh, the idea is that we just want to be consistent with it. So, um, so if we call, yeah. It, since energy, since this is energy conservation, it doesn't really matter um, in terms of in terms of that because we're, we're really taking care of the sign here and the fact that um, it's starting from a height of ten, so it's positive. Um, this isn't a vector, so the the direction here isn't 
isn't affecting affecting this. This is a positive amount of energy. So you don't have to worry about the negative there. Or the negative there. Um, where we would see the negative would is if we were to change the relative point, or if we were to go say below this ground, underground, then it would be a negative height. Something like that. All right. Uh, hopefully that didn't confuse you. So now part three is well, let's use our impulse. And let's figure out what our change in momentum is. So the impulse, what impulse was supplied from the ground? Well, it's going to be P final minus P initial. So now we do need the ma mass of the bouncy ball, 0.1. What was V final? Well, V final was after the impact. This is after. This is before. So after the impact, it was traveling at positive 13.6 meters per second, upward. Uh, and then before impact, it was going negative 14.4 toward the ground, 14.14. And so we can calculate this change in momentum, and we get 2.774 kilograms meters per second. What we would, what will we do with this number? Well, now we could use it to, for example, find if the impact time was a certain amount, how much force was exerted on the bouncy ball, something like that. All right, so um, that's going to be it for the notes for uh, momentum and impact, or <laughs> momentum and impulse in this chapter on momentum. Um, and so I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I will talk to you soon.